Thank you very much, Ambassador, for that very, very interesting uh, talk and with its uh, fascinating aspects, particularly uh, I found the facts on the value that was, is added to a, a nation by uh, democracy. I was intrigued by one of the slides um, where uh, the votes had come up from the people. At most were just over 50%, but there was one uh, very long red one which was put so it was about 90 percent. Yes, that one in the middle. What was that for? <laughs> this may be a difficult question to answer. <laughs> it's the ears. Um, well, there are some other Swiss here. Was it the Alpine Initiative? Excuse me? The, the Alpine Initiative? That, I think that was also a very large majority for that. I don't know. <laughs> 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 well, there were like more difficult questions, I hope, but I'm glad that the other Swiss are not able to answer the leader. Yes, please. One of the experiences we've had in New Zealand with citizens writing referendum questions doesn't binding, but you get complicated questions which don't bring very much and people don't actually understand what the question means and you'd be asking to ask yes or no. Has there been any experience of that in Switzerland? Yeah. Um, there are a number of rules obviously that apply. One of them is that um, um, there needs to be, how should I say that, um, it's only one topic that can be submitted to the people. And also, you can challenge the way the question is put to the people in the courts and think, hey, that question is not right, the way that it's put, it's, it's, it's biased or it's not clear or whatever, it can be challenged in the courts. So, um, it has to be, the questions have to be drafted very, very carefully. And, and <coughs> really simple, only one question, only one topic, otherwise this would lead that um, um, an initiative for example is null and void. Is there any restriction on how frequently the same question would be brought up? I ask this in the context of the fact that when I came to New Zealand in 1966, <clears throat> at each parliamentary election, the same questions on the liquor law were asked. And they were not the questions that people wanted to be asked. But right through until when, sometime in the 1970s, the same question was asked. But it was the wrong question. But is there a, you, you've covered the point of getting the question right. But if you're rejected, can you go back next year, or is there a, 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 a set down period before which you can't have it again? No, you can go back. Year um, after year. Oh. Well, it's a bit difficult on finding all the people that would yeah. sign yeah. up for that, but if you do find it, you can go back. Um, it was in 1986 that the government thought it's time that Switzerland would join um, the United Nations, and um, people said, no. Nope. We don't want to. But then, um, 2002, it was even a citizen's initiative that demanded that Switzerland became a member of the United Nations. So it was the same question, basically, do you want to become a member of the United Nations? I was put to the Swiss people again. And there, yes, we had an overwhelming majority, finally, which means 10 years of United Nations membership this year.
Yeah, and I mean that's the result of it is um, we are this. We are not a member of the European Union. But saying that, I mean, we are in the heart of Europe. And this map shows it too, and there are hundreds of bilateral agreements that we have with the European Union. We are to a very, very large extent integrated in the, in, in the European um, landscape. But it's true that um, the Swiss citizens are not ready to become a member of the European Union. Um, it is said that many feel there is a lack of, um, of, 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 um, uh, of, of direct democratic rights, that they would give up sovereignty. And if you look at that, I think it's, it's not only a thing that you will find um, in Switzerland this feeling of loss of sovereignty. Um, it's just in Switzerland we can express it by saying hey, we do not want to become a member of the European Union. That's probably, I mean, life for the world has become a global world, much more interconnected, uh, we have to work together. It's not anymore the small entities that can decide on solving the problems that the world has. And so citizens, it frightens them. And um, because we have that American private rights, it's probably the result. But, um, Ambassador, you've, you've given us a pretty persuasive, positive picture of the <coughs> benefits of direct democracy in Switzerland. Um, I wonder whether perhaps it encourages people to take very much a, an inter, inward looking at sort of their interest view. Maybe that's one of the reasons it took so long to, for Switzerland to go into the United Nations. But my real question is do you seriously think that 
uh, Europe would be as peaceful um, and as prosperous if all those countries which are currently members of the European Union uh, had systems of direct democracy. Because I, I, I rather suspect that while it is good for Switzerland, Switzerland has, if you like, the luxury of being a relatively small country, surrounded by a group of countries with a, a quite um, uh, uh, mutually antagonistic histories, which, however, have managed to weld things together in a way which has generally been quite valuable over the last 60 years. Do you think that it would work for a wider range of European countries? Well, there's a lot of things in there. <laughs> um, well, first of all, it's not by accident that the European Union got the Peace Nobel Prize. Uh, and I mean, we know that. And Europe would not be what it is if it were not for the European Union. And we acknowledge that deeply. Um, <clears throat> This system works for us, and it doesn't mean that it necessarily works for another country. And it works because, you've mentioned one of the elements, because it is a small country. I think that definitely helps, but it also helps um, being a very um, literate country. We also have no analphabetism, there is a very good media available. And bear in mind what I mentioned initially, this has not come overnight. It's a system that developed in the 19th century, step by step, more rights. So, so the country, the citizens have learned how to deal with it. And it worked well so far for us. But that doesn't mean that this is a recipe for others. It's worked well for us. And as I said initially, we are proud of that system. And there's something, frankly, it's very nice if you get asked every three months on the things that really concern you instead of other people deciding for you that I can elect any fourth or third year. Um, yeah, it's nice. But if it works for Switzerland, it doesn't mean that it works for every other country. I mean, I would, you would absolutely totally wrong if that would have been the message now. Have you got any statistics on voting turnout and compared to elections? Marion, um, the Swiss were very late giving women the vote. I think it was 1971, which sounds very undemocratic. Is, is there some reason behind that? What, what would be your answer well, to that? The reason is direct democracy. It's Swiss men who have to vote. It's Swiss women who have to vote. When we finally got to that point, it was with a very good majority that they said, nevertheless, yeah. Well, they're not to be.
was granted women the right to vote. That wasn't the immediate aftermath of a war. Uh, that was men were at war, women were at home, they had to do everything. So it was just impossible not to grant them the right to vote if they did everything during the war time. So Switzerland does not have this experience. So that might have played into it too. But mind you, just today I read um, uh, from the World Economic Forum publishes every year the, the, the gender gap report and it was issued today. And um, despite the fact that New Zealand uh, was the first country to introduce um, uh, to give the women the right to vote, but New Zealand ranks sixth 